And so I shared one Monday night, and it said something like, um, it's okay to fall apart once in a while. Tacos do, and we still love them. <laughs> and I saw another one the other day I'm going to share that I loved, and it was on the wall in, in the bathroom at uh, Descanso uh, Restaurant. <laughs> Didn't have anybody's phone number. <laughs> but it said, um, I'm really glad I don't have to hunt for my food because I don't even know where tacos live. <laughs> so I, I got this collection of taco memes going, so... Anyways, hey, listen, um, I want to thank you guys for having me tonight, and um, I really thought and prayed into what I was going to talk about tonight, and I'm going to, I felt like the Lord was telling me, set it up for tomorrow. So I'm going to, I'm the, I'm the warm-up band for Jerry and Jeremiah for tomorrow. And I think if we're going to understand what it means to abide, there's a couple of things we have to understand about God, the abiding one, and what that means and what he means to us. So I'm going to cover that. I'm going to cover something else too. And then um, I'm going to do a little reading tonight, but let me open a quick word of prayer, and then we're going to get into it. So, Father, thank you. I agree totally with Victor. I agree totally with Jerry. In that um, there's a room full of guys here that all of us could use a touch or a word from you. And so, Father, wherever anybody's at tonight, I pray that through me and through Victor, I mean, yeah, through um, the, the leading of the songs through Victor, Jeremiah, and Jerry, uh, Father, I pray that there would be um, receiving of encouragement and enlightenment, Father, through what's presented and what's sung. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. So, you guys, listen. Um. I'm a big believer in word pitch, in, in pictures. I, be, I believe strongly that pictures say a thousand words. So I have a few pictures tonight that I want to share with you. Um, tonight's message is called Abiding in the Abiding One. We're going to read. I'm not, I'm not really going to speak um, from one. I'm going to speak from one little part in chapter 15. But like I said, I'm going to set up Jerry and Jeremiah for tomorrow. So look, at, I want you to look at this picture, you guys. Uh, that's not the one. <laughs> All right, we missed a picture. So, wonder what happened to it. Huh. No worries. So I'm going to show it to you guys. No, actually it's better on the iPad anyways. Can you see it? Can you see how beautiful it is? Most of these pictures I took. This one I didn't. This one I took from Franklin Graham's website. I'm going to talk about the abiding one tonight. The creator of this magnificent view this these mountains the guy who made this made it from scratch wants to have a relationship with you i didn't take this picture all the other pictures i took the guy that created this The God of the universe who created us from dirt and in five days made the earth and all its creation. You guys, 
is not some pie-in-the-sky God out there that we're not supposed to connect with. God wants to have a personal relationship with you. This God that made this. I know that we don't think about it sometimes in those terms because sometimes God is far off. But let me read some from Hebrews. So Hebrews is a book to the Jews, to Jewish people that have accepted Christ, but they're having a hard time staying with the faith. And so most people believe Paul wrote Hebrews. So he says, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. Not a lot different from what we experience. We all have stuff that we have to work through. We all have process that we're working through. Sometimes it feels like, like struggling and suffering. It said, but after your enlightenment, you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your own property. In other words, you endured the persecution. You endured what was coming at you. But then it says, since you knew that you yourself had a better possession. So he's talking there, of course, about your relationship with Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, and a and an abiding one. Listen, we're going to be talking about abiding this week. It's very difficult to, to see yourself abiding maybe the way God would want you to, to the fullest extent that God would want you to, if you don't trust in the person you're trying to abide in. Does that make sense? If you guys only have a vague understanding of who God is, you're going to have a hard time trusting him. So what I'm going to go through is going to take a second. But I want to, what I want to show you is who the abiding one is and what his heart is towards you. When I tell you that the creator of that wants to have a relationship with you, I'm not wolfing. So let me go to the next Listen, huh, these are not in the right order. Okay. Um, so you guys listen, what I want to talk, or one thing I want to bring up is there's tons of religions, religions in this world. There's Buddhism, there's, um, you know, um, Muslim belief, there's, there's all kinds, and I guarantee those gods, those entities, they don't get to create stuff like this. They don't even have the power to create stuff like this. And God has been here from the beginning, and he's going to be here till the very end. And so um, I'm not sure what to do because this, this, these are not... Here we go. You guys, God's been here from the beginning and he's not going anywhere. If you guys remember the beginning of the Bible and the Jewish faith, God was at the very beginning of that. I don't know where all these other entities came from or when they came into play, but not only did God, not only was God there from the beginning, but he's going to be there at the complete end. And so what I want to show you is his heart, or talk about is, our, is his heart towards you guys. Because he created us, and he created a garden, and he created a space where he could actually come and meet with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, and he met with them, and he dwelled with them, and he had a relationship with them. And then when Satan came, there caused some separation there, and Adam hid and God couldn't find Adam, and God said, Adam, where are you? Where are you? And from that point on, there has been nothing but, but the whole Bible is, a, is a, 
an example of time after time of God making plans to come after um, his kids and to be in relationship with you because he's crazy about, about you guys. He can't, get, he, he can't get you off of his mind. He can't quit thinking about you. And let me show you some of the things he went through. He created a nation of Israel. And all the way from Genesis through Exodus is nothing about nothing more than God trying to make a way to get back into a relationship with those folks. And, and they did it through sacrifice. And then we see where Moses entered the picture. And God wanted to have a people to himself. And the people actually refused to become the priesthood. And so he, he gave Moses the plans for the Mosaic Temple, and that temple was all about sacrifice. And that sacrifice was the way that we got back into relationship with God, okay? And then David comes on the scene, and they had lost the ark in battle. And what did David do? David went right after the ark. You want to know why? Because that's where God resides. And, he, and, and he, they, he wanted to restore that relationship between God and man. And then we have the, the, the temple that Solomon built. And that temple was all about praise and worship. But that is where God dwelt. And then we have this, this, this little series of all the major and minor prophets of Israel sinning and God restoring them. And then there's... there's um, there is, uh, they're disobedient, and, and God disciplines them. And then he brings them, restores them again. And there's a whole series of that until we come to Micah, or Malachi, I'm sorry, we're, that we're starting, um, that Jerry started last Sunday. And all through that, God was trying to show that he wanted to be in relationship with his folks. It's a story about that. But then there was 450 years of silence. And then God's ultimate plan comes on the scene, and that is Jesus the Messiah. And his main name was Emmanuel, which means what, you guys? God with us. And in that sense, we actually had God with us on earth. And what Jesus introduced was not only him being the Messiah that we could talk to, but when he left, he promised the gift of the Holy Spirit. So now we don't have God dwelling in a temple of rock and wood. Now, because of what Jesus Christ did, we have our earthly temples and the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. I don't know if you guys are getting the picture, but all through the ages, God has actively gone after relationship with you. And there's another one coming. There's another appointment that's coming for mankind. Let me see if I got it up here. In Revelation 21, you guys have all heard about the return of Jesus. And I want you guys to, to um, look at one, a couple of phrases in this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and for, the first, and for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We're the bride. Jesus is the husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, you guys, here's what I want you to see. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. We're living in the former things right now. 
when Christ comes, this is where we're going to be living and residing with God. And I don't know if you can see it, but from the very beginning, his whole plan was to be with mankind. And when we get done and we're in heaven, we're going to be residing with God. So just a little rabbit trail, you guys. Don't think that, that we are not part of that, okay? Your spirit is eternal. Your soul is eternal. And you guys have a choice on whether you get to partake in what we're talking about here or not. Because our spirits are going to live forever. We just get to choose where that's going to be. In other words, we can choose not to accept the gift that Jesus has provided to us. And we'll spend an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Or we can accept what the gift that God's given us now and then we can see that we're going to reside for the rest of our lives, our eternal lives. We're eternal also with God. And the point is, you guys, this was God's plan all along. There's nothing right now that's catching God by surprise. There's nothing right now that, he's, that, 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 is, that is tripping him up. Or saying, oh man, I didn't see that one coming. The time clock for man is winding down just like God wants for it to. If you guys are forerunners in any way. And you're watching the signs of the times. That time clock is clicking down pretty fast right now. And the, everything's aligning. But the point is, God, it's, it's all coming down the way exactly the way God wants wanted and the, his whole purpose for all this is to be in relationship with you i'm gonna i'm gonna see let's see what's next abide i actually love this i'm gonna go back a couple of slides after i get done with this but i actually put what the meaning is up there i want you to look at that last one to remain in the same place over a period of time so you guys listen this abide is going to apply to you. If you're a Christian, this abide applies to you. But it also applies to the God that you want to abide in. The, to remain in the same place for a period of time, God certainly does that. To stand against opposition, to hold out, to stand fast, opposed to waver. There is no waver in God. But look at that last one, which I love. It says, the party which remains true to the agreement. You know what? That agreement for God is to himself. Because he's a holy God and he's true to himself. And he remains the same forever and ever. But that's what abide means. It means to remain. It means to be, stead it means to be steadfast. So I want to go back to this other slide, you guys. It's kind of a, a little note I picked up. I love it. I want to point out some things in it. This is God talking. It's not out of the Bible, but whoever wrote it, I really like, I like it. And it said, I'm here. I love you. I don't care if you need to stay up crying all night long. I will stay with you. You guys, that's abiding. That is the abiding one. That was the greater possession that the Hebrews were talking about, the abiding one. There's nothing you can do, I'm sorry, there's nothing you can ever do to lose my love. I will protect you until you die and after your death. And that means if you remain in him. I will still protect you. I am stronger than depression. I am braver than loneliness. And listen to this. This is why I put this up here. And nothing will ever exhaust me. You guys have to know that God is inexhaustible. There is no beginning, or there is a beginning, but there is no end to God's power. and There is no end to what he won't do to try to get, after, get to you. And that includes create situations in your life that make you so desperate that he makes it to that where 
your back's to the wall, and he's about the only person you can turn to. Don't think that those situations, those struggles that you're up against isn't God working in your life because he does love you and he is going to stand by forever and he is inexhaustible. Okay? Let me go on. We know that he's inexhaustible. We know that he's good. We know what his character is like. In other words, now we've seen who he is. He is the abiding one. We can trust him with anything. So let me get to, I got to go through a couple of slides. Sorry. Another beautiful picture. Listen, I took this one. The God who created that is the abiding one and he wants to have a relationship with you. So I'm going to read this. Again, I'm going to let Jerry and Jeremiah talk about most of this tomorrow. I'm going to focus on the end. But here's what it means to abide. Here is, um, you guys, take this to heart as I read. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Each branch in me that does, does, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide, you remain in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, and whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm going to read from up here. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. I want you guys to notice something. If. There's a lot of ifs in this. You don't, you don't get the spiritual benefit without doing the spiritual work. In other words, there is something on your end that you have to do to abide we know who God is. The whole point of the first part of this was to understand the abiding one, his character, his nature. He's going to come through on every single thing that he says he's going to do. But now it's up to us to remain in that as well. If you abide in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father's glorified, that you may bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. I don't know if Jeremiah and Jerry is going to touch this tomorrow, but it doesn't say my believers. It says my disciples. Ones that are disciplined, ones that are doing the work, ones that are following me, ones that are taking up their cross and, and, and moving forward in life in my likeness. Not the ones always presuming on God's grace. Not believers, disciples. You guys with me on that? It's a big difference. And there's a lot of people stuck in believing and they need to understand the scriptures a little better because it asks you to be a disciple and to be a follower of Christ. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, if you, if you keep my commandments, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And the part I want to focus on is this last, very last part. 
It says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be, that, I'm sorry, that my joy may be in you and that, you, that your joy may be full. Um, the Lord has prompted my mind on something about six times already, and I'm going to go ahead and say it right here. Do you guys get what that means? That your joy might be made full. He's talking about this process right here of abiding up above. And if you can do it, your joy will be made full. So, you guys, listen. We all have stuff that bugs us. We all have stuff that gets under our skin. We have stuff that that comes at us that really trips us up. Um, We get super discouraged. But we don't have someone that we can't go to. We don't have someone that we can't put off some of this stuff on and, and, and put it on his shoulders. So there is a peace, there is a joy, there is a maturity that's going to come if you start learning to abide in Christ. That's what that's saying. In fact, let's see, let's see what's next. Apart from Christ, there's no fullness of life, just doom and gloom. And I mean that literally. Apart from Christ, there's doom. There's no life. And then apart from Christ, there's gloom. In other words, you don't have the resources to handle some of this stuff. I'm, I know you guys are going to probably laugh or smile, but I'm serious. I'm 62 years old, and I know that I look like I'm 35, right? <laughs> My mom is 82. She looks much younger than that. Jerry was saying he was 62 over at the table. He doesn't look 62 to me. No, that's not what I was saying. Hey, you're blowing my point, okay? (laughs) What I'm telling you guys is um, gloom and depression and heartache and not having anybody to rely on and not having your eternity solved, where you're going to go at the end of your life, having not, not having that solved is nothing but hardship on your body. And there is 50-year-olds that look like they're 70-year-olds because they don't have Christ in their life. So you need Christ for your salvation. You need Christ to cover the doom part, but there's also the gloom part. It's a heavy weight to try to, to, to carry on life on your, in your own strength. I have lost a son. I have, I, I mean, I've gone through a lot. I know you guys have too. All I'm saying is I can't even imagine going through some of these things and not having God and not having Christ to turn to. And that's what that's talking about is, look at John I read, read the ESV, the Amplified, I love it. I told you these things, that my joy and delight may be in you, because Christ is in you, and that your joy and gladness may be full, be a full measure and complete of overflowing. And I love this one from the message. I told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy. In other words, I'm abiding, my eternity, where I'm going to go after I die is set. And I have supernatural help for everything that I face going through this world. And your joy, holy mature. See, the holy mature comes from abiding in Christ that Jeremiah and Jerry are going to cover. Abiding is something that is learned. It's kind of like faith. You have different abiding muscles. We're not born just trusting God with everything. In fact, we don't even know how to trust God with everything. 
you know, when Adam sinned in the garden, he went from abiding to striving. Because all of a sudden now he's doing everything on his own. We're the same way. It's a big deal to God. You guys have an opportunity this weekend to start learning to abide with the abiding one. If you guys don't know Jesus as your Savior, you need to get to know him and be able to start abiding in him because he's trustworthy. And you'll have that benefit while you're here in this world and also on, on into eternity. I took this picture. This is in, William, this is in Wilson, um, Wyoming. It had just finished raining. You know, this is one of those lucky shots you get. I'm going to say it again. The guy that created that has a whole Bible of him trying to chase you down to have a relationship with you. The guy that created that wants to have a personal relationship with you and he wants to enter into an abiding um, relationship with you. You young people here, I know that you guys like challenges. And I'm telling you, if you want the greatest challenge of your life, start learning to live in Christ and abide in Christ. I already said that, uh, that abiding is like faith. You build your faith muscles, you build your abiding muscles, and I love this verse that says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. That's what I'm saying. You can't abide in somebody you don't believe is, a, is available to you or, or has the power to work on your behalf. You're not even going to put your trust there. And that he rewards those who seek him. You guys have heard me say this several times. I hope you hear me say it a hundred more times. You go hard after God and you watch what happens. James 4.8 guarantees that how the discipline and the fervency that you put forward to getting to know God, he will meet you with the same velocity. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I'm going to close with this picture. Uh, you know, the word journey gets thrown around a lot lately. It's kind of a very popular thing to say I you know my journey my journey my journey you guys are in a position this weekend to do exactly what that little guy's doing you're in a position to get off by yourself for a second and look up at the sky and look at the guy that created all that and start asking a few questions like how do I abide? Am I, am I really trusting you with, with my life? Am I trusting you with my salvation? Am I trusting you with my eternity? Because you guys got to understand that this is a journey. And this is all of us. Because we never get to the end of God. Man, um, my experience is, um, to me, God is like rooms. And I explore that room. And I know, I find out more about God and more about God. And I feel like I've, wow, this is really great. And then in the corner of that room, there will be a door. And then I start studying some more and I go through that door. And then there's like a whole other realm of God. And you know what? 
I see this picture and I, don't, I wonder what's going through this little guy's head because that's really all of us. We're God's kids. I don't know what he's, I don't know what the picture was meant to portray that he's thinking. But I think you guys have an opportunity this weekend to get alone with God and maybe ask some questions. Um, as a PK growing up, as a pastor's kids growing up, I lived the longest time off my parents' religion. I think it's really appropriate for me to say, um, and I'll speak for Jerry and Jeremiah on this too, is um, we don't ever want you guys to follow us. We're, we, want you, we want to be in relationship with you. We want to help discipleship, disciple you. We want to help you to learn to abide. But the person you go after is God. And that takes, that takes some time of real, um, you know, we talk about reading the Bible. It takes reading the Bible, but it takes time of reflection. It takes time to talk to God. See, God doesn't only want to abide with you like you have to sit there and listen and read the Bible. That's not abiding. There's conversations that go on. So again, I'm going to knock it off here. But my point is, that little guy is all of us. And there's a wonderment and a creation and a majesty to God that we don't even understand until we start seeking him and getting off on our own with him. Start asking some of our own questions. And whatever you guys got, I promise, Jesus and God are not afraid of your mess in any single way. Whatever you got, there's no place that you can't start being this. So, Father, I just thank you for uh, what you've done for us. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who was obedient unto death. He is our perfect example of what it means to abide in you. And so, Father, I pray that um, this, this weekend that there would be some, just some fantastic understanding brought forth about how to abide in Christ. I pray, Father, that there be some fantastic understanding about who you are and who you want to be for each individual here and who you can be to them and what you can be or what they can be to you. So, Father, I just thank you for this weekend. I thank you for everybody here. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that your, your spirit would speak to every um, hurt every doubt, every fear, every disappointment, every objection. every embarrassment, every shame, See, your word, Father, says that you came to give us life and life full. That's what the end of this verse talks about, that we would be mature, Father, in you. I pray, Father, that there just be a path that that starts with every individual tonight. If we have seasoned brothers here, Father, let that path start anew. Let it, let it open up a new room. If there's a brand new Christian here, Father, let that past start anew. Father, we love you and we thank you. And Father, we mostly thank you for the way that you love us and what you did for us. In these things we pray. Amen.
change our hearts, God. Be filled with you and your love. God, allow us to focus on abiding in you. Following you. Yeah.